Well, hello and welcome to Worship at Newtown Congregational Church, United Church of Christ for this May 15th, 2022. We're so pleased that you're able to join with us on this special day as we come together to celebrate the love of God and the calling of Christ. A reminder to all who would follow in the way of Jesus that we are called to live out the commandment to love uh, with such abandon uh, all around us. Uh, everyone whom we meet. We're going to talk more about that a little later in our service, but I have a couple of announcements to let you know about right now. First announcement is that next Sunday, after our worship service, we will be having our annual meeting of the congregation. So a reminder to all of our members, and we hope you can join us for that. Uh, since you're watching us online, we want to make sure you know that you can join us via Zoom. You don't have to be in the building with us and uh, you can be a part of the meeting uh, and we'll be sending out information about that next week so that you can join us and be a part of that but also if for some reason you can't be a part of it um, in either in person or uh, via zoom you can um, request and get a proxy form for uh, having someone else uh, be your vote for that um, for that meeting and the information about that as well. And also, you should be receiving information about uh, getting your annual meeting report so you can review all of that um, prior to our meeting and make sure that you're informed about what is happening and uh, what our plans are for the future. Um, we have that announcement. The other announcement is that we do have this tag sale coming up that our church is sponsoring where we are hosting a number of nonprofit organizations to help them raise money, the uh, giant tag sale on our church property. Uh, and we are looking for volunteers to take part in that. So if you are interested, you can call the church office and let us know that you might be able to help us with a number of things to make that day possible. And uh, there's information about that in uh, emails and the like that have gone out as well. We continue to do any number of other things as part of our congregation from um, mission and reaching out, extending God's love in a whole variety of ways and making a difference in our world. And you can be a part of that. Um, pay attention to your announcements uh, and also just uh, look for other announcements about other activities that will be coming up and things that will be happening in our church that uh, you probably want to be aware of. So if you get an email, it's good to look it over. Click it and review it. We're going to try and keep our emails um uh, not send you an email every single time we have something happening, but we also uh, really do count on folks looking at their emails and uh, reviewing material so that they can know what is happening. That is our announcements for today. Uh, let's continue on with our worship by moving into this time of worship by sharing and knowing that we are surrounded by the peace of Christ that sustains us. And so I say, Peace be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you on this day as you join us for worship. Oh, we are Christians by our love. 
When we come together as Christ's church, as followers in the way of Jesus, we come together mindful that we are a praying community. And we welcome the prayers of those of you among us. If you have prayers uh, that are and, and have um, people or situations that you would like our staff to be aware of and to be praying for you uh, to keep in our weekly prayers ourselves, uh, Please do reach out, uh, email the church office, let us know that, uh, that you have prayers for us. But on this day, on this Sunday, let us gather surrounded and held by God's love. And let us be a praying community, a community that is transformed through the act of praying together by opening ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Come, let us pray. How wondrous is your great and forgiving love, Almighty God. How wondrous is your life-giving power. With joy we revel in the glow of the sun on this day, and we wonder at the light and life that is sustaining us every moment of our existence. That you have opened for us in the raising of Jesus from the dead, this power of grace that sustains us in all things. As people born of Christ's Spirit, we are awakened to a world that is still caught in the night shades of brokenness and sin. A world that feels and experiences suffering great and small. Here in the midst of all that is called death, we long to bring life. We long to see Jesus, that we might lift Christ up as the beacon of your love and promise to our world. Hear our prayers for those who are in, indeed suffering on this day, O Holy God. The hungry and the homeless, the sick and the imprisoned, the angry and the lonely and the lost. We pray that you would not let our concern pass from our hearts as these words pass from my lips, but rather that you would empower us to do your work of healing and reconciliation in the midst of all the lives we encounter. Oh, holy God, may your love flow in and through us. We specially lift up to you this day all those who are close to our own hearts, those needs we are so often reminded of for ourselves and our own needs and for our loved ones near and far. As you made a fearful and disjointed band of disciples into your holy church, we pray that you would make us anew, that we, your body in the world, would serve you with joy and hope and thankfulness all the days of our life. In the name and spirit of Christ, our Lord, we pray these things, praying also as we were taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue to celebrate how all of us are making a difference by sharing of ourselves to serve in Christ's mission and ministry, both through our church and in ways beyond our own congregation. And thus, we celebrate when you are able to make gifts to us uh, through your mail-in donations, through your online giving, or when you are with us in person and are able to uh, make a contribution at, one, at our worship service on Sunday morning. But uh, in all those ways and in all the times of our lives, we want to celebrate and honor the power of the giving that is at work in and through each and every one of us and through our whole community. And so in that spirit, I'm going to offer this prayer on this day, this prayer that celebrates the way in which we share God's love through what we give of ourselves and of our resources. Let's join together. God of love and grace, in the gift of your beloved child Jesus, you sought to redeem our world from the grip of self-centeredness. On the last night before his death on the cross, he gave those who would be his disciples a new commandment that we should love one another as Christ loved us. For centuries now, we have struggled with that, far too often failing and falling short of that mark. Every once in a while, we get it right, and we know that fills your heart with joy. Some will be expressed through this church's ministry, some through the ministry of the wider church of which we are a part. Some of what we share will touch the lives of people we have never met. And thus we pray that all these that we offer, these expressions of your love, whenever we give it and however we are able to give it, will fill your heart with joy and our own hearts as well. And to this end we dedicate all that we are and all that we offer to you. In the name and spirit of Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of John. It's found in the 13th chapter. It is the story of the last night of Jesus' earthly life as he is with his disciples. Uh, and the story begins here in John, when, where we pick it up, is where Jesus actually decides he's going to lead by example. And he's going to wash his disciples' feet. And then, uh, as part of this uh, a longer um, commentary uh, of this story, we pick up a conclusion. We're going to pull in a few verses that um, are part of this storytelling, which is about the commandment Jesus gives to the disciples, this new commandment that really is an old commandment, but this new commandment uh, that they love one another. And thus he gives both an example of how love is expressed um, so that then this commandment can be manifest through all that the disciples do in the name and spirit of Jesus. And so this is found in the 13th chapter of John and it begins with the third verse. It continues on to the 17th verse, and then we'll hear the 34th and 35th verse. So, hear these words from John's Gospel. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table and took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but then also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And for this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You, have, you call me teacher and Lord, 
And you are right, for this is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Here ends the reading. May God add understanding to these God's holy words. Will you join with me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, gracious God, you who are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. D.A. Carson, who is a New Testament scholar, says about Jesus' new commandment um, uh, these words. He says there's this an, an irony in this. He says, this new commandment is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate, and yet it is profound enough that the most mature believers are repeatedly embarrassed at how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. Indeed, this new commandment that Jesus says, a new commandment, um, uh, that he lays out is really uh, a very old commandment. Uh, but Jesus brings it to center stage by saying, this is something uh, that basically, if you think about it, this is Jesus' last night with his disciples, his last earthly night with them. This is a core understanding, and this is the core commandment that Jesus says. You know, that there are other commandments that are important, uh, surely, but this is this a new and greatest commandment, or at least a new phrasing of this, which is, as Jesus has taught in the past, love your neighbor as yourself, but now he's saying, love one another as I have loved you. And if you love one another as I have loved you, if you love in this way, everyone will know that you are my disciples, they'll know that you, for if you love one another, you'll reveal yourself as my disciples. So the call of the community of followers is first to express this love, to be so loving of one another uh, and so committed to the act of love that it transforms how people view them. Um, so you got you to gotta practice this. Uh, and, and this is not like going through the motions kind of things, right? Uh, and, and Jesus talks about this commandment, as I said at the end. But what does he do before this? Well, we hear this really uh, kind of a classic story that's told in Christendom. Um, and it's the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. He takes off his outer robe and he wraps a towel around his waist. And in fact, um, the towel is... Um, Ministers, uh, when, when ministers like myself in, in, um, in worship, when we wear a robe, we wear a stole over it. And the stole is understood to be symbolic of the towel, taking up the mantle of the servant leader with the towel that is wrapped around us so that we can proclaim that we are the servants of love. Uh, that, is, that is at the core of who we are. Um, and washing the feet. Jesus you know, starts washing his disciples' feet. Now, sometimes in the church in, in, in present day, you know, we have rituals like right around uh, Holy Week time where people will wash each other, you know, wash people's feet. And some people go, oh, don't touch my feet. You know, I don't know if I like that. And, uh, because it's strange for us. We, we are not in a culture and a, a society, a community, where foot washing is common practice. In Jesus' day, foot washing was common practice. In fact, Probably almost every day people had uh, their feet washed uh, when they came into uh, 
their own household or when they came into a household of a get of a of a of a host, um, you know, and there were guests, uh, your feet would be washed because you're walking around in the ancient days, really dusty, dirty ways. As Jesus says, you know. And Peter, and Peter says, hey, wash me everywhere. Jesus, and once Jesus says, first Peter says, no, you're not going to wash me because you're the master, you're the teacher. And that, that's a thing for servants, and we're going to get into that in a second. But, but then Jesus says, hey, if I don't do this, then um, you can't be a part of what I'm, I'm doing because you're not, what does that mean? I think that means because you don't, you're not going to really understand it. Um, and Peter says, hey, well, wash all of you. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to wash all of you. I'm you know, you don't need to be washed off. I'm, I'm washing this part uh, of the feet. And, and it's, it's both a practical thing that is done, but for Jesus it is also this symbolic thing that Jesus is doing. But it's symbolic not because it's unusual, right? Washing feet in Jesus' day was something servants did every single day, if you had servants, or was something that a, a person who had lesser status um, would do for somebody with higher status, or it was something that a host would do for one's guests. Uh, but it was common. It was every day, you know, and one of the things about washing feet these days is people kind of say, oh, this is a special thing we're going to do and it's only symbolic. Well, part of the symbolism for Jesus wasn't that you just did it this one time. It was that this was a practice that showed forth what comes in Jesus' message a little later. This is the way we practice love. And if we're going to practice that love, uh, I want you to see it uh, as he says, this is you, know, you call me teacher and Lord, but, um, uh, and that is true, I am your teacher and Lord, but look what I do. Look how I express my love for you through my service to you, through common practice, right? This isn't like Jesus saying, hey, everybody, look at what I'm doing, eh? I special because I'm doing this. No, Jesus is doing something that would be commonplace every day that many people would just take for granted. It was striking to the disciples because they're like, no, no, you're, you're higher than us. We see you as teacher and Lord. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Um, no, no, no. If you want to understand this, you have, to, you have to take on this mantle of being a livers of this love. My commandment that you love one another means you serve one another. You, you care about what is best for one another. This is the important thing about love. Love isn't just like I have... Um, you know, nice kind of romantic feelings for you or warm, fuzzy feelings for you. Love is this expression that, that gives itself in, in service and, and, and doesn't seek to be controlling of the other. Here Jesus is saying, I, I'm not trying to control you. I'm, I'm serving you. Um, Rob Bell uh, has, has these words to say about love. He says, love is giving up control. It's surrendering the desire to control the other person. The two, love and controlling power over the other person, are mutually exclusive. If we are serious about loving someone, we have to surrender all the desires within us to manipulate the relationship. So one of the things that servant love does is it recognizes that I'm giving up control. I'm not trying to control the other person. And still in our day and age, this is a hard thing. You know, for many of us, both in interpersonal relationships, but even as we live out expressions of love in the world. What's so often you want to do? Well, I'm going to love you, but I'm going to get you to do what I think is best for you. Right? And of course, servant love, as Bell is talking about it here, I think, is a love that says, no, I'm not going to try to control you. I'm going to just um, surrender all the desires within, within me to manipulate the relationship, even even in ways we think I, I, this is going to be better, and and that's a hard thing these days. I think so much of what passes for love in our world, very often, is a love that says I'm going to you know control you, or I'm going to manipulate you in some way, greater way, even you know for your own good, right? And that doesn't mean sometimes when we love people we want don't want what's best for them, what we think is best for them, and wanting to maybe, and sometimes maybe even needing a requirement for somebody that's in danger or is, or, or is facing some other kind of crisis or situation that we, we don't want to keep them safe. But, but the underlying girder of love is, is that we're not trying to manipulate them, that, that we act out of this idea of servant um, that is not trying to impose or control or manipulate the other. 
Uh, and Christians, to be honest with you, I think, you know, wrestle with this just like everybody else. Um, and in fact, um, well, uh, it's, it's really hard to do that. You know, some of us say, well, I'm loving. You know, maybe you know, we kind of love our family or other people, sometimes not perfectly. Um, but as that love extends out into our world, very often um, we're not very good practitioners of love. Even Christians are not. In fact, G.K. Chesterton has this classic line uh, that he wrote. He said, the Christian ideal, which in this case I think the Christian ideal is love. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, this love stuff is, is challenging. In fact, I would argue uh, we don't come to church to worship on a regular basis because we want to be convinced and believe stuff. Sometimes that's what people say. Well, don't you go to church to become a Christian, you know, so that you can believe, you know, things about Jesus and about God, about the Holy Spirit, and you know, believe the Bible or learn, you know, what's in the Bible. And those are all kind of good things, um, not necessarily bad things about coming together in, in, in the Christian way. But I think the, the, that the core of why we get together in worship and to practice um, is. Uh, and is, is to practice love uh, because it's so hard. It's so challenging. And we need, if we are disciples of love, if we're disciples and followers of Jesus, and then we're disciples of and servants of love and servants of this servant kind of love uh, that, that doesn't try to manipulate and control the world, but really embraces the, the love of the other um, in, this, in this fuller sense of of surrendering our power and control of it. And because that is so difficult and challenging, we need practice and we need support. Um, and you know, some people say, well, I'm a good person and so I just practice love. Guess what? Yeah, a lot of good people who are, are reasonably good people, you know, not evil, awful people, still are not great practitioners of love. I'm not a great practitioner of love in many situations. I need all the help I can get. And that's why we come together. That's, I think, why we join. Because we need a place to help us, to, to, to help us along our way. I mean, and let's, you know, let's face it, in an hour a week, when we're living out in the world with multiple hours a day at work and on the highway and online and everywhere else we find ourselves, um, you know, it's kind of actually when you think about it, God, just having an hour to try and, and, and bulk up our, our love, servant love muscles and skills, that's not a lot of training. Um, and, you know, that's why I, though, I think we need to, to come together as, as much as we can and find communities that, that can help us to continue to do that. Well, um... The challenge for us is, is so often that this, this love is, feels like it's so fleeting. Even for us, I mean, sometimes at the, the, our own core, how much am I beloved by God? You, that's part of what we need to hear, too. You are beloved by God. You, you are practicing the servant leadership by Jesus because you are loved. Because I have loved you, as Jesus shows them. I, I, I washed your feet as the sign and symbol of my love for you. Um, and the commandment is not just do this and, you know, kind of like grit your teeth. Okay, I'm going to be a loving person. Arr! No, it's, it's just flow that love out. And, and that's a challenge. And I think we know we don't do well at it and, and we don't hear it so well and, and, and do it so well. And, and um, in his book, uh, The Book of Beb, Frederick Beekner, uh, this is a novel uh, about uh, the, and the main protagonist in this story is Beb. It's Leo Beb, and Beb is a seriously flawed hero, you know, protagonist of the story. Beb is not necessarily like you can kind of say, "Oh, he's a good Christian person who just does everything." No, he's he's kind of kind of a, he's kind of a questionable character. Um, but Beb is um, is offering a speech 
uh, at one point in the novel, and 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 he's talking about um, this this need that we have um, of this community of love. Um, that's what the kingdom of God is. It's a community of love. So he puts it like this: Beekner, you know, writing, but uh, Beb, the character speaking these words, says this: "The kingdom of heaven is like a great feast." That's the way of it. The kingdom of heaven is a love feast where everybody's, where nobody's a stranger. Like right here, there are strangers everywhere else you can think of. There are strangers um, that was born in the same womb. There are strangers was raised together in the same town and worked side by side all their life though, through. There are strangers got married and been climbing in and out of the same four poster together for 35 or 40 years. And they're strangers still. And Jesus, it's like most of the time, he's a stranger too. Even when he's near, as the end of your nose, people make like he's nowhere around. They won't talk to him. They won't listen to him. They keep their eye on the ground. But here in this place, there's no strangers. And Jesus, he isn't a stranger either. The kingdom of heaven is like this. He said, we all got secrets. We got them same as everybody else. Things we feel bad about and wish we wish hadn't ever happened. Hurtful things. We're all scared and lonesome. But most of the time we keep it hid. It's like every one of us has lost their way so bad and we don't know even which way is home anymore and only, only we're ashamed to ask. You know what would happen if we would own up that we're lost and, and ask? Why, what would happen is we'd find out our home is each other. We'd find out home is Jesus loves us, lost or found or any which way. That's what the community of Jesus is. This love feast. This community of love. It's why we, we come together. It's why we need each other. Because most of the time, we, one way or another, as it said here, we find ourselves being strangers, even to some of the people that we want to love the most. Oh, what a struggle that can be. But in the love community, when it's practiced fully and embraced totally, bit by bit, we discover the miracle and the power of love that only not only is shared with us, but that, that we can live out and share with others. Well, that's the message for the day. Go out. Practice servant love. Knowing you, you, you are beloved by God. And you are part of God's grand community of love. Amen.
My friends, Christ has given us a new commandment, that we love one another as Christ has loved us. By this, everyone will know that we are Christ's disciples if we share that love with the world. And through this love, all things will be made new. Go now and do as Christ commands. And as you go, may the peace of Christ Jesus ever enfold you and the love of God ever encircle you and the fellowship of the Spirit ever enrich you now and forevermore. Amen.